Hello, welcome everyone. Hello and good afternoon. We are delighted that you've taken the time to join us for our first ILPC seminar of this new academic year. My name is Norni Lidjan. I'm director of the Information Law and Policy Center, which is one of the academic centers here at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. I expect that some of you already received notifications about our work and events, but if not, please sign up to our mailing list or follow us on Twitter. But now it is my very great pleasure to introduce our panel for today's seminar. Our key speaker today is Bethany Shiner. Bethany is a lecturer in law at Middlesex University London, a research associate here at the Information Law and Policy Centre, and is completing her PhD at the University of Oxford. Bethany is also a qualified solicitor advocate and prior to her academic career was a judicial review lawyer at Public Interest Lawyers. Her publications and research expertise are in public law, including the areas of judicial review, human rights and the use of data in digital political campaigns. Our discussant for today's seminar is Dr. Patrick O'Callaghan. Patrick is a lecturer in law and director of graduate studies at the School of Law at University College Cork. Patrick is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the British and Irish Legal Information Institute, Bailey, which is a prominent member of the Free Access to the Law Movement, an international movement of lawyers exercising an important civic function in making legal materials freely available to the public online. Patrick is also co-director of the Irish Legal Information Institute, and his main area of research focuses on the legal protection of personality rights, and his most recent work has focused on two such rights, the right to be forgotten and the right to freedom of thought, both of which will be quite relevant today, especially the latter. So in terms of format, our key speaker, Beth, will present for approximately 15 to 20 minutes, Beth, followed by Patrick. For the Q&A session afterwards, we'd be very grateful if anyone could highlight any questions or comments they have for the speakers in the chat section of the screen. And then I, as chair, will raise these questions for our panel. In terms of recording, only the presentation section of the seminar will be made publicly available after today's event. And the Chatham House rule also applies for any discussions or comments in the Q&A session. So under this rule, for any of you who don't know, that means that anyone joining us today is free to use or cite any information from the discussion during the Q&A, but they may not attribute these comments to any particular person. We've adopted this Chatham House rule in order to encourage open and candid discussion on what are very important and often controversial issues in the area of information law and policy, and today's topic is no exception. So now I thank our speakers and you for joining us here today and will now invite Beth to begin today's seminar on the viability of a Ministry of Truth for political advertising. Thank you, Nora. Um, you'll have to excuse me for a minute while I faff about trying to share my screen without the notes that I have. Okay, so let's share screen again. Okay, Nora, would you mind confirming that you can just see my slides? Yes, yes, I can. Beth. You can't see my notes? No, just your slides. Wonderful, thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, um, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Nora, for the invitation. Thank you, Patrick, for agreeing to be the discussant. Um, this is um, the, at the beginning of um, some research. So this is a work in progress and it's a very complex um, area. And so all I'm going to do today is lay out some headline issues um, following what has been some uh, recent calls for the truthfulness of political content, particularly political advertising, to be verified and monitored in some way. Um, and so very quickly, I'm going to uh, run through the problem, which the. Oh, Beth, you've gone on mute. OK, I was just muted. Fine again. OK. <laughs> um, OK, so, um, yes, I will go through the proposals quickly, um, discuss what the government is doing about the topic, about the problem um, before um, concluding 
I'm not proposing any particular reforms here. Um, many, many reforms have already been proposed. Um, and so I'm only looking at some specific proposals. I really welcome open discussion afterwards. So please um, don't be shy to ask any questions. OK. So um, the problem, uh, I think, is nicely, nicely um, captured in this Hannah Arendt quote written long before uh, the Internet and long before the problem of um, online disinformation. And um, the quote here by Hannah Arendt is nicely mirrored in the House of Lords introduction to its report on digital technology and the resurrection of trust, which I will talk in more detail shortly. And the report says, in the digital world, our belief in what we see, hear and read is being distorted to the point at which we no longer know who or what to trust. The prospects for building a harmonious and sustainable society on that basis are, to all intents and purposes, non-existent. So, of course, this problem matters because dem democracies rest on, on the agreement that exists between the electorate, those elected to governors. And so what we're talking about is political agency and the exercise of our agency. Um, we have provisions to ensure free, fair and clean elections, which is based and founded on the idea that the electorate can make and should make rational choices and the electorate needs information upon which to vote uh, to base those voting decisions on basing decisions on lies um, would mean that we are unable to exercise our free choice and of course from that flows the point that we have to have trust in our democratic processes in order to accept the result of an election or referendum. Um, there are two faces to the very broad problem of political disinformation, as far as I can see. There's an external face and an internal face. The external face is the orchestrated uh, foreign state disinformation campaign which we can see through the employment of troll farms, hack and leak campaigns and so forth. And there is the internal face of the problem, which is the degrading or corrosion of political communication within our own country, with our own politicians using half-truths, misrepresentations, factually incorrect statements. And I wanted to make this distinction because a lot of the discussions around regulating disinformation model up these two elements of the same problem and the same problem of course leading to the same result which is distrust in democracy and potentially distrust in election outcomes and of course there are different degrees of political disinformation there are blatant fibs lies or partially true and partially false information and then groundless speculation The three proposals I will talk about. Um, firstly, we have the House of Lords Digital Technology and the Resurrection of Trust report I mentioned earlier. This report was published June of this year and makes in total 45 recommendations. The first of which is that a regulatory committee, which would be made up of the Advertising Standards Authority, the Electoral Commission, Ofcom and the Use Case Statistics Authority, should cooperate to develop a code of practice for political advertising, along with political parties, and it would have the ability to restrict fundamentally inaccurate advertising during election and referendum campaigns. Secondly, the Intelligence and Security Committee published its much awaited Russia report in July of this year, which covered many aspects of the Russian threat to the UK, so-called, um, with a, a section committed to um, Russian disinformation and 
influence campaigns. And um, the ISC asked that the government urgently establish a protocol with social media companies to uh, remove content part of a hostile state's disinformation campaign and political influence operation. Finally, the Digital Culture, Media and Sport Committee engaged in an eight report in July 2018, its final report February 2019. And since these reports, uh, the committee has a subcommittee specifically committed to disinformation and it is following up on the committee's recommendations in those reports. And it's been repeatedly calling for legislation which would create a new duty of care upon companies and it would establish an independent regulator. And that legislation would specify disinformation as an online harm, which would allow for the removal of such content. So, some of these proposals, although recent, some of them go back to 2018, and there have been um, other sources of such proposals including the all-party parliamentary group on electoral campaign transparency. There's been reports from the Electoral Commission, um, all making various helpful recommendations, but there has been almost no action from the government. In um, July uh, 2019, the government did establish a Defending Democracy programme, which had the which had the four aims set out um, on the slide there. Um, most relevant to this topic is the first one, um, protecting democratic um, processes, systems and institutions from interference, and lastly, promoting fact-based and open discourse. But there really is very little transparency about um, how these aims will be achieved and how the government will measure the success of this program. There has also been the establishment of a counter disinformation cell and a rapid response unit, which appear to have the means by which um, they can respond to disinformation online. At the moment, specifically, the efforts are focused on coronavirus disinformation. And uh, disinformation, once identified by the cell and, and the rapid response unit, are then urged for removal by social media companies. Um, social media companies may label the content as false to limit its spread. And also there has been instances of direct rebuttals on social media to coronavirus related disinformation. And it'd be very interesting to know um, whether there's any research into how effective these um, efforts have been on combating coronavirus disinformation. And of course, um, another government, uh, I won't say um, action because it currently is not an action, the online for a bill, an online harms bill. Um, the paper was published in April 2019 and there was initial consultation response published this year, February this year. Initially, the online harms white paper did discuss disinformation as being within scope of um, the proposed law, which would mean that um, platforms and companies would have the statutory duty of care to potentially remove disinformation as far as um, it is an online, it considered an online harm. Um, in February of this year, there was no mention of um, disinformation as falling within scope. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about, firstly, what is going to happen with the online harms bill. It doesn't look like it will, um, be passed at the earliest of 2023, and it certainly doesn't look clear that disinformation will feature as an online harm. Um, and that is 
um, despite the fact that the House of Lords um, and um, the digital, um, the DCMS committee have all requested that the online harms white paper include this information. Finally, there is, um, I think what it is worth mentioning, there is a digital imprints consultation, which has recently been announced. And um, this would be to um, ensure that digital uh, political content has an imprint indicating the source of the material to match um, hard copy material that is a law that already exists for um, leaflets um, and so forth. It's not focus on the content of that material but it, I thought it would just be worth um, mentioning. So what are the problems with some of the proposals in in regards to uh, regulating and removing political content online? This is an obvious point um, but information is nuanced um, and disinformation can be nuanced. I said earlier you can have um, partially true, partially false information which can be difficult to correct and certainly time consuming to correct. Um, political statements of course are contestable, often reflections of ideologies and spin. However, errors of fact do need to be corrected. But do we need something new to do that? We already have processes for these. Um, fact checkers exist. The Office of National Statistics, the BBC Anti-Disinformation Unit, newspapers, media briefings, all accountable. The extent to which they are resourced um, is a different matter. But the tools um, to counter um, political uh, uh, incorrect facts already exist. Um, secondly, some questions about how this would work in practice. Content once removed can and does reappear online very, very quickly. And um, requirements to remove disinformation <coughs> will lead to a constant exhausting state of heightened moderation, which might not actually clean the political atmosphere. Um, Facebook itself has an inconsistent approach, which according to an article um, based on um, a memo um, from a whistleblower, um, suggests that content removal for some countries is valued as being more important than other countries. Finally, um, there is value in using human rights as a guide for tackling uh, this complex web of problems presented here. There is a pro possible problem of over removal, which obviously would undermine freedom of expression if that content is legitimate. Um, also, we have seen that the moderation and removal processes can and, and have been used against human rights defenders, where the content has been flagged as disinformation and removed and has taken um, you know, a significant period of time to be reactivated. Um, also, the right to freedom of thought. Um, it's a right I'll be studying in more depth during um, my PhD at Oxford, which um, Nora mentioned, and Patrick and I have been doing some research on this as well. And there is very little jurisprudence on what the right is exactly, but it could certainly refer to um, preventing the free flow of ideas and information. And it might also include an examination of the possible ways in which freedom of thought is obstructed, hindered or suppressed. And it's, there's certainly an argument that freedom of thought, of course, is dependent on access to credible information. Now, in this country, um, 
with the debates ongoing about how to tackle the problem of disinformation, human rights does not appear to be being used as a guide for um, various different regulations or various different methods. Of course, um, this is being thought at, at different levels. Um, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, for example, is developing a set of guidelines on how um, we can address online disinformation, further um, endangering other human rights. Um, this is the penultimate slide. Uh, Another issue with the proposals being by these parliamentary committees is there is absolutely no executive support for a new body to regulate content of political statements, which in itself may not be um, problematic. Yet this is coupled with um, the current government's refusal to establish the extent of the problem. So the DCMS Select Committee um, requested and called on the government to launch an investigation into the extent of foreign influence, disinformation, funding, voter manipulation during the Scottish independence referendum, the EU referendum and the 2017 general election. And this was mirrored by the ICS call um, for an assessment of potential Russian interference in the EU referendum. And the government flatly re rejected both calls. Um, finally, these proposals don't won't uh, touch the very lucrative industry that feeds uh, in disinformation. There are huge financial gains to be made. And there's a global PR industry, which is increasingly using fake news and manipulation of social media to gain political power. So some very, um, two, in fact, preliminary conclusions. Um, the first point is that the um, external and internal faces of the problem that I mentioned earlier the external problem being um, the orchestrated um, um, attempts by a foreign state to hijack the political discourse within another country to maybe um, sow discord, um, polarisation or maybe to influence an election outcome. This is the external face and the internal issue is the growing is the use of um, misstatements um, manipulation of the presentation of information all the types of trickery we saw in the um, 2019 general election this internal and external faces i think they attract um different solutions and there's a much better argument for content removal in relation to the external problem where you can um, you can identify orchestrated efforts to artificially shape political discourse in another country. You can monitor bots, anonymous um, accounts, trolls and so forth. But when it comes to half truths the, and um, this internal problem of misrepresentations, the trickery I mentioned um, in general election campaigns, I don't I think this requires a, a different response that does not aim to remove aims to raise the standards of political communication through other means. And that could be, um, and these are just some preliminary ideas, I'm sure other people have many better ones, um, fair journalistic funding, the establishment of political codes, um, greater responsibility on political press offices and so forth. <coughs> Secondly, and finally, um, the law uh, should be used to help create and preserve the conditions in which free political expression and access to credible information can occur. Rather than being concerned with trying to assess the value of content. Um, and it is through this environment in which that um, lies can be discovered and understood through a process of interpretation and dialogue. And related to this problem is the lack of clarity about the 
various different forms of disinformation and how they raise different but at times interrelated problems. Um, you would have seen recently the big protests at Trafalgar Square um, against some of the coronavirus lockdown measures. And it's easy to um, to maybe laugh at people who believe in um, conspiracy theories. But, you know, these are corrupting people's beliefs and, and behaviours on a large scale. There's a, the muddying up of um, theories on uh, fringe issues and political um, communication and political intentions. So um, that's it for now. Um, I will stop sharing my screen and thank you all for listening. Thanks so much, Beth. You've raised so many very interesting and very, I think, uh, legitimate criticisms of the the legislative and policy responses so far here. But um, before I, I take the chance to follow up on any on any questions, uh, it would be fantastic to hear Patrick's response. Patrick, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Nora. And um, thanks, Beth, for a really thought provoking presentation. I'm delighted to be here today uh, to act as discussant. Um, Beth, you, you explained how the House of Lords Select Committee proposes a code of practice with sanctions in order to, quote, restrict fundamentally inaccurate advertising, end quote. Um, and a regulatory committee would adjudicate breaches of the code. And you outlined a range of problems and concerns about this proposal and, and other proposals. And I, I share many of these concerns because whatever we might say about, about trying to prevent disinformation, say, on scientific facts, say, inaccurate claims about maybe vaccinations in the context of the ongoing pandemic, whenever, whatever about seeking to prevent this sort of in, disinformation, I think we ought to tread really regulating political speech, even if the intention is to prohibit only fundamentally inaccurate information. And that's because, as, as Beth mentions, the very nature of politics is that contestable statements will be made. Now, we have different views on how society should be organised, different views on the role of the individual, the role of the state, um, and on political matters, people have such profound disagreements with each other that it's regularly the case that one group thinks the other group is peddling, quote, fundamentally inaccurate information, end quote. So I share some of the sort of concerns that Beth was, was raising about how such regulation work in practice. But I'm also worried about the consequences of, of such regulation for freedom of expression, freedom of thought and democracy more generally. So I think that Beth is right to say that our focus should be should not be on the content of political advertising, rather it should be on what we might call more broadly um, architectural issues. Um, and I don't know if anyone read this, but there was a really interesting essay a couple of years ago in, in Wired magazine written by Azar Raskin, who um, argued that free speech is not the same thing as free reach. So there, there's a right to free speech, but there is no right to algorithmic amplification, he argued. So rather than focus on the content, as, as Beth was saying, um, we could, for example, focus on targeting bot accounts on, on Twitter. Um, and it also seems to me that the digital um, imprint proposal that Beth mentioned is, is a good one. And it's unobjectionable from the perspective of the rights to freedom of expression and freedom of thought. And in fact, it supports the right to freedom of thought because we'll have more information about the source of political advertising. We know where we stand. We can make more informed decisions. But in, in thinking about all of this, I, I somehow have the feeling that the various regulatory proposals that Beth outlines, I, I somehow have the feeling that they seek to treat the symptom, but not the disease itself. By the way, I'm also realising that thanks to this pandemic, I'm increasingly drawing on medical related examples and metaphors. Um, <laughs> but but let me let me try to explain for a moment. So so disinformation is, is clearly a problem in many countries in 2020. But there's always been forms of misinformation and disinformation. We've just called it something different. These these labels are, are, are simply new. 
So I guess the question we have to ask is, is, is why so many people are seemingly drawn to it today? And, and this is an obvious point. I'm sure it's an obvious point, but, but people are more likely to be influenced by misinformation and disinformation when, when they lose trust in public institutions and, and in the media. And, and Beth mentions trust a number of times in her presentation. And in recent years, we've seen this trend, this um, losing trust in public institutions. We've seen it in, in many post in the USA. And, and this morning, I tried to find the most recent surveys on trust. Um, so the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer states that just 36% of respondents in the UK trust their government in 2020. Trust in the media, or so in, in the USA, the equivalent figure is 39%. So higher in the USA than it is in the UK. Um, but the same figure for trust in government in the Netherlands is 59%. Trust in the media is at 35% in the UK. It's at 48% in the USA, um, a good bit higher, and 58% in the Netherlands. Uh, the euro found data is even more recent. That was collected in April during the pandemic, and it shows much higher levels of trust in public institutions and in the media in, in Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and the Netherlands compared to the UK. So rather than looking at the symptoms merely, I, I think we should try to tackle this disease of distrust. And there are undoubtedly many, many reasons for increasing levels of distrust. I, I think economic inequality likely looms large in the background. But I find the statistics about trust in the media particularly striking. If it's, if it's really the case that two thirds of people in the UK distrust the media, this is a huge problem since, you know, the traditional public interest journalism was, was always and, and generally agreed to be one of the most important ways of sourcing accurate information. And, Rightly or wrongly, I think one of the perceptions that's emerged in recent years is that journalism has become less objective or, or neutral and, and, and more biased in some way. Um, of course, we have to be aware of the context here. It's an industry that's been under huge pressure with advertising revenue dwindling. The money is going to Facebook and Twitter. And as a result, journalists sometimes feel, I think, forced to be more kind of clickbaity in their approach and to have a a strong presence on social media themselves, usually on Twitter. But, but if people feel they can't trust the media, they're going to turn elsewhere for their information. And I think this partly explains why, why misinformation and disinformation have become so widespread. Um, so just to sum up my thoughts, I, I, I don't think that the idea of government regulating political speech is a good one. I don't know, instinctively, I don't like that idea, even if it is well-intentioned as it could lead to all sorts of unintended consequences. And in any case, it's treating it as a, it's treating the symptom. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what I think about self-regulation. There's a lot of social pressure being placed on social media platforms to remove material. And it would be good to hear if Beth had some thoughts on this. Um, I think the best approach is to treat the disease itself. How do we ensure more trust in society so that fewer people are taken in by the claims of disinformation. Tackling economic inequality is a big part of the answer. Encouraging more public interest journalism at a, a, a low lines recently about an Australian proposal to tax social media platforms to fund the news media. I, I don't know a lot about these proposals. Perhaps there's somebody in the room who does. Um, in addition, having digital media literacy as a core aim of the educational curriculum, as in Finland, would help. We need people to maintain a critical, reflective attitude about information online and, and about life in general, actually. Um, so I think all of this will help treat the disease. Misinformation, disinformation will continue to exist. They'll, it'll continue to flow online. But if an adequate percentage of the population has trust in public institutions and the media, then I think we'll have sufficient herd immunity against misinformation and disinformation. You see, I can't get away from these pandemic-related metaphors. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thanks again, Beth, for focusing on this incredibly important topic today. Thanks so much, Patrick. And I think I speak for all of us when I'm sure we can 
we can never get enough now of all those uh, COVID related metaphors. Now, Patrick, that's pretty much uh, the space we're, we're all in. Um, Beth, would you like to uh, respond to Patrick before some discussion? Yeah, sure. Um, I won't take up too much time um, responding. Um, I think um, um, the point about there's a right to free speech, not to free reach is really important. And previously I, I have um, argued for the methods of spreading disinformation to be the target of any regulation, never the content. And um, so when I um, plucked this topic, I was really testing um, what I'd written before and what I'd thought before. And I thought that maybe actually I would be, pers be persuaded by an argument that disinformation is so corrosive and so pervasive and that politi politicians are just so um, reckless and have such disregard and such disrespect for the electorate that actually there should be consequences for, um, you know, abusing information or facts in in these ways. Um, you know, ordinary people have standards and expectations of truth telling, of transparency every day, all day. Um, and yet in, in the space of political discourse, um, we have, you know, we do have mechanisms by which political speech is held accountable, but the efforts to persuade people in these benign ways and these unclear ways, I think is contributing to this um, problem of trust. And it doesn't necessarily matter whether or not these efforts work, whether we are influenced or to what extent political decision making may be swayed. Um, the point is that um, the electorate is at times treated with, with such disrespect. Um, and um, how do we address that? Well, I don't know. Um, I think there are so many different things. And I don't actually know if law is the place to um, restore trust. And I think that actually lawyers should be um, cautious about um, wading in on, on that conversation, except, except to the extent in which we can preserve the, and protect the space for free expression, for free thought, for the open flow of credible information, the architectural issues that you said. Um, Self-regulation, is that an answer? Um, well, we've seen uh, many platforms and technology companies um, recently really uh, step up their efforts to clean the, um, the, the space on their platforms. Um, we've also seen a lot of um, companies sign up to um, the code of practice on disinformation with the European Commission. <clears throat> And um, there's been the removal of a lot of conspiracy theories, um, the pe Facebook pages, um, content. We've seen the removal of um, bot accounts. Um, we've even seen um, the removal of, of or flagging of false statements by uh, the president of the United States by by these companies. And so the, there has been a real, um, a, well, not a real, but a, a, a change in pace and a change in tact when it comes to this issue recently and coronavirus has really ex ex accelerated that i think um and um moderators though are are still faced with a huge huge task um and this continues to be huge amounts of money to be had in, um, you know, malign interference and political players using these platforms to deceive their own citizens and so forth. And so this moderation um, and these self these methods of self-regulation, I think, are short term um, and there needs to be something longer term. Um, and also, in any case, you know, these platforms are self-serving profit seeking and um so we have to be really cautious about 
that's how much power we give them um, because they are they already govern the space in which a huge portion of our freedom of expression is exercised. And so do we want to encourage them to be you know, arbitrators of truth? Of course, uh, Facebook has just set up its you know, so-called Supreme Court and it has a board and it's appointed its members. Um, and so it will be um, interesting to see the suggestions that Facebook um, values removing content in relation to the elections in some countries like the US and the UK over other countries like India, Bolivia, Brazil is really concerning. Um, so that's that's all I'll say. Um, I, I couldn't think of any um, coronavirus puns there. Sorry. So I'm sorry about that. I think Patrick, Patrick <laughs> did very well there. I think he took up an awful lot of them. <laughs> yeah. um, well done to both of you. I think you've covered such a, a huge um, topic. And I think you did tremendously well, Beth, by outlining all of the different policy responses that we've had, particularly not just in, in the UK, but also at the at the EU level. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts in terms of how best you think, I mean, do you, I, I'll put you on the spot a little bit, but basically all of the all the actual actions, there have been proposals. So we had, you know, the online harms paper, obviously, and there are very, there's, you know, there was the, the EU code of practice, um, the information commissioner's office here put forward a code of practice for political campaigns. Um, she sought for that to be put on a statutory footing, but we'll, we'll see what, what happens there. Um, I think lots of, like a lot of legislative matters in this area, um, there was huge focus in 2018, and then, of course, we lost huge momentum, and now most things are focused on COVID, even the metaphors in our academic discussions in this particular seminar. But any of the self-regulatory measures to date, they all deal with this issue in an ex-post fashion. They're not preventative. And then that's when the damage is ultimately done. You know, you have fake accounts, fake reactions, the manipulation of content, the disinformation, it happens in so many different ways. And even just this week, you had a leaked memo from a data scientist working for Facebook. And she blatantly admitted in, I mean, it wasn't intentionally leaked, but, you know, when you email a memo to six and a half thousand people, I think there's a certain intention there that you maybe do want it to get into the public arena. But having said that, she gave a number of examples about how the policy just simply was not working in terms of moderation. But even if you did have fantastic moderators in place, you know, who were adequately resourced, and I think that is questionable in terms of Facebook, you are still dealing with this problem after the fact, if, when the damage has already been done, when people's views have already been manipulated or shaped or impacted upon. So I think that's hugely problematic. And I very much agree with you, Beth, in terms of what what actual impact have these self-regulatory measures had? And we still seem to be getting, you know, versions, you know, of this same approach, like the oversight board that Facebook has recently established, which has an incredibly purview in terms of what they can actually review and the actual impact that they will have, I think, is highly questionable, even though I have, you know, a lot of respect for, you know, the various academics and experts on that particular board. I think their impact is, is going to be quite questionable. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone as well who joined us this afternoon.